everybody. Welcome to our seed starting workshop today. My name is Emily Becker and I'm a garden specialist with Rural Cap. And I'm joined today um, by my friend Keenan Plate, who is the farm manager at Grow North Farm. It's an urban farm and farmstead for refugee farmers in Anchorage. And I think we'll also have a few, I don't see them, I'm not sure if I see them yet, but um, we have some of our gardeners from Haynes, the Haynes Victory Gardeners, who are also going to chime in. And really, um, it's this is a nice size group, so we're hoping to have a really good discussion about seed starting. And um, our program today um, is kind of dual. So we're going to talk about seed starting but also talk about how you can host a seed starting event in your community. So maybe if you work with youth or a church group or something and you wanna get people together and start seeds, we're gonna talk about both of those things. And before we get going, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Iva from Rural Cap and she'll just tell us a little bit about our Rural Cap Grow program, which is co-sponsoring this event with the Cooperative Extension Service. Cool, yeah. Um... I feel like a lot of you have been to the previous one, so I'll keep it brief, but Rural Cap is a nonprofit that was started in the 60s with the mission of improving the quality of life for low-income Alaskans, and we have programs in housing, education, and health and well-being, and so this is one of our health and well-being programs, and um, basically we provide funding and technical assistance to um, community gardeners in rural Alaska. So we are now working with 10 different communities um, across the state from, I think the furthest south is Metlakatla and furthest north is Shungnuk. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun and they're doing a variety of different projects. Um, so this is part of our effort to um, yeah, like increase the knowledge and communication um, between gardeners in rural Alaska. So thanks for awesome. being here. And also people who are in rural Alaska too. I know probably a lot of you aren't, but um, yeah, if you want to take a moment to like put in the chat where you are right now or where you normally are, where's your home, um, it would be cool to see where everyone is. And yeah. actually, um, if you could also add, so maybe where you're from, but also your experience with seed starting, like if you consider yourself a beginner, uh, a intermediate or an advanced, that would help us as well. And I do see your question, Laura, we'll get to that for sure. Um, making your own potting soil versus buying it. Um, so with, and uh, I see Mardell is here and uh, I, do you wanna go ahead and maybe introduce yourself really briefly, Mardell and also Keenan? Um, hi, I'm Mardell, and I have been part of the Victory Garden in Haines, and I am, my passion with being part of community agriculture is teaching people and making, agri uh, making growing your own food available, and so I'm particularly interested in how we can um, teach people and just show people that it's not rocket science to do it, and so that's kind of my passion and why I'm here to see what you guys are doing, and I'm happy to share my experiences with that. Sure, and hi everyone, my name is Keenan. Uh, I work with Catholic Social Services and the Refugee Assistance and Immigration Services Program, uh, specifically managing our agriculture program, which includes uh, Grow North Farm, as Emily said, and then also includes a Fresh International Gardens um, a, like farming cooperative. And um, yeah, I've been starting seeds in Anchorage with a lot of our like refugee growers for the past uh, three years. Um, so maybe not a ton of experience in like compared to some other Alaskan gardeners in starting seeds, but um, definitely some experience with leading like seed starting workshops and uh, yeah, kind of troubleshooting what works and, and what doesn't work. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen here. And let's see. Um, and I, what I'll do is uh, add some experience here from you guys and answer questions. So as I mentioned, 
you know, we're kind of doing two things. We're going to talk about seed starting, but also talk about um, how to host an event in your community. I've had a lot of experience doing this with students, with children, but uh, a little bit with some church groups as well. And um, I guess I'm an advanced a uh, master gardener in Alaska. And I've been doing this for a while, but there's always tons to learn. And the thing about this, I would say, is that there are so many different ways to do it. And there's really no like best, best way. It's really what works for you. So uh, really you're getting a group together and this is a perfect time if you're, if you're working on, you know, putting a group together, this is a perfect time to do it. This, you know, my intention with this program is to think about uh, seeds you can start with that don't require grow lights. And I'm also going to talk about some cheap ways you can use recycled materials. Like if you, you know, yeah, definitely if you, you have money to invest in some of the good stuff, which I've done over the years, that's great. But you can get a group together and plant some seeds without a ton of money. So we're going to talk about the things you can plant now. Let's see. Okay. So where should you get seeds? Number one, um, well, Facebook is great for this. Maybe not for a ton of other things, but for gardening, Facebook is an awesome resource. I've joined Buy Nothing groups and received seeds, you know, just by asking. My neighborhood has a seed library, and I know there's definitely communities around the state where they actually have seed libraries in the actual library. I know Homer has one. I think Esther has one. If you are from the Tanana Chiefs area, you can get free seeds from the extension agent, Heidi Rader, just, or ask your tribal council. Those are great places. If you're getting a group together, you might like, you know, ask people to contribute and, you know, um, you know, just get seeds online. Of course, it, you know, seeds, the, the germination rate for seeds depends on how they're stored. They can be stored for years and years and years if they're stored under proper conditions, which is usually cold or freezing. And of course, with free seeds, you don't know that. But, you know, I keep my seeds in my cold garage and I am able to start, I was just, you know, just started some tomato seeds that I've had since 2009. So definitely lots of places you can get seeds. So I'm going to pause here really quickly and just sit, just ask um, where people's favorite places to get seeds in Alaska. So I was mentioning Foundroot, which is a great Alaska company. Um, there's another one, it used to be called Denali Seeds, but they're, they, they're known as Best Cool Seeds because they're not Alaska-based anymore. That's another group that has done a lot of, you know, they have a lot of experience with sort of cold weather seeds. And um, Keenan, go ahead. I know you were, we've been talking about where we get seeds. Yeah, and I think one thing uh, too, I guess the first thing that uh, came to my mind when I saw your list, Emily, was um, saving your own seeds. <laughs> That's probably my favorite way to to get seeds is from saving seeds that I've grown. And I know that that can be a really intimidating thing, but there are uh, especially like I'm great. Uh, it's great that I've put in Foundroot in the chat because they are a really awesome resource and really encourage people to do their own seed saving. Um, and I know, yeah, it can sound really intimidating, but there are a lot of plants that uh, can grow really quickly in Alaska and can still save seeds. Like I know like nasturtiums, I'm usually saving like my nasturtium seeds every year. Um, I've saved like dill seed in the past and calendula seeds. Um, you know, you can always save snap peas and beans um, are pretty simple too. Um, so yeah, that's probably my favorite way to, to get seed is from, from seed that I've saved myself. Um, but outside of that, uh, like as Emily was saying, I like to, to spread out um, to a lot of different seed companies in the lower 48, but usually northern ones that grow in northern climates. Um, and then I have a few specific seed companies that grow certain varieties for a lot of like refugee and immigrant communities, because we try as much as we can in our refugee agriculture program uh, to grow crops that our clients are familiar with. So I like to kind of search for some of those more unique uh, seeds. Awesome. Thanks for that reminder. Yes, um, saving your own seeds. And it, 
it can seem um, really intimidating at first, but if you start with the easy ones and then build up from there, you'll pretty soon, like peas are really easy to save, chives, things like that, you'll soon be saving lots of your own seeds. And then you can work up to more the more advanced things like tomato seeds. I haven't gotten there yet, but may, maybe soon. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back to my little program here. Um, okay, so what type of seeds? This spreadsheet I got from my friend Deb Blaylock, who's a um, advanced master gardener out in the Palmer area, and this is her seed saving schedule. So if you are thinking of starting your seeds now and you don't have grow lights, you're thinking about some things, um, my dog's here, um, that you know that you would start and I think like a, a great time for window starting seeds is April so your zucchini squash cucumbers all of these things in the red circle can be started now and they don't necessarily need grow lights you can put them in your window and this is a great chart that you know she just distributes freely I'm going to have a link in the chat that I can put there so you can have this um, spreadsheet for your to save for yourself as well. So if you are gardening with a group, very often, I know at least with children, I, I really had to teach, and, and you're planning on putting starts in the windows, you really need to teach them about south side, you know, south facing windows. So one time I had a group of middle schoolers and I had them dr just draw a little sketch of their home because I knew they were taking plants home to put in the windows. So, you know, you could see here, Maria has some really nice, um, really great Western exposure with a little bit of South side exposure for her plants. And, and that was pretty good. You really, you don't have to have South facing windows, but I think it's a great idea to teach people, you know, what they are so they can figure it out. And um, this is a great, you know, and I'll put the link in the chat here too. This is a great little um, program from the University of Oregon where you can put in your Latin long and it'll tell you, you know, your sun exposure that you're going to get at least from the from the south and it's really fun for people to be able to see you know what the difference is we're almost to march 20th and that's the you know the altitude of the sun in the sky also um i did do a very you know quick experiment one year where we planted dahlia bulbs this was um at airport heights elementary and we put uh, we planted two bulbs of the same kind and our sixth grade we are windows faced west and we did it with our second grade buddies and their windows faced east and really um you know we ended up with, these were the plants and they were pretty you know they're a little bit leggy um this was east and west exposure but they turned out really great and um you know, if this was just with window growth, and they were pretty much equal. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's a really very extremely scientific experiment, but it does show that east and west windows do pretty well. Obviously, the best is to have a south facing window. And if you're working with a group of people that, you know, they may have not started seed before, it's really important to let them know, like, okay, you need to have um, your plants in the sun, and they need to be turned so that, you know, your plants are getting you know, equivalents light as they grow towards the sun. And I'll stop here for just a second. And um, any input from, from our experts or from anybody on our call about plants in the windows, how you've done with seed starting in the windows. Um, my experience has been that um, you, you can grow them very successfully. I did it for many, many years, but the last couple of years I have gotten lights since LEDs have made it much more affordable to do. And um, I do find that my plants are healthier as a result of that because they stay stockier, but it definitely can be done. And the key, like you said, I believe is turning them and moving the plants around and then another subject on to that is at the same time as I put some wind, I put some fan on that to, to you want to stress out those plants a little bit is really what you're trying to do. And so that's kind of been my experience at the Victory Garden last year. We had everything under lights or almost everything because we don't have great um, lighting in a warm enough place. And um, boy, what a what a deal that was, but we were able to manage to do it. So 
Yes, thank you for mentioning wind. You're, you know, if you do stress those plants a little bit, their stems are going to get a little bit stronger. They do need that in order to, you know, um, just survive in the wild. <laughs> Let's see, any other comments? Um, the cool temperatures, especially at night. Um, I don't know. I, you know, again, I mean, I, I think plants are used to that. Um, they, they, you know, in the natural environment, they do get cooled off at night. So I, it hasn't been a problem. And I know that at Airport Ice Elementary, those were really old. <laughs> this was an old school before the remodel and those plants did really well in the windows. Keenan, did you have any experience with that? Uh, like with the colder temperatures from the windows, I, I haven't noticed any, any of that, um, yeah, plants, yeah, not not liking be, like being close to the window overnight. Um, yeah, I think other things that I've done before too for some varieties, like for some tomatoes or in other varieties that like uh, like warmer temperatures for germination, I'll actually put them in the boiler room for like a day or two. At least in my office, we have like a boiler room that that gets pretty warm, and I'll put the the flats in there for a day or two to help kind of warm up the soil um to allow those seeds to germinate and then and then right right before they germinate then I'll, I'll bring them outside to get under lights or get on the windows to get some sunlight Ooh, that's, that's a good way. hack yeah because mm -hmm. you know obviously you can buy seed starting mats they're you know little warming mats um and you're correct you 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 only use those mats for just a few days you just want them to germinate and then you take them off the heat but that's a great cheap way to, <laughs> to do a, a heating mat all Emily, right, would you it. mind if I made a made a addition? Go ahead. Um, so my name is Gina Dion. I'm the program assistant at the Anchorage Outreach Center, and I am the master gardener lead there. And one thing to remember about heat is it will make your plants grow. The warmer they are, the more they will grow, and it can contribute to legginess. So being near a cool window or being in a cooler location is sometimes better for compact, strong plants. Uh, because they're not feeling like they have to grow so fast that they get leggy. So, cool. Thank you. Okay, so back to my little program, and here's where I'm going to say, but wait. Okay, um, you can also start seeds outdoors right now. If you haven't heard of winter sowing, it's sort of like a trend that has swept the nation, and it's basically where you make a mini little mini greenhouse and then let nature do the work. And it's, you basically take a milk carton, you cut it in half, you fill the bottom with wet soil, you do put drainage holes in it, and then you just stick it outside. <laughs> of course, you put the seeds in there. Um, so these were some cartons that I put together last year, and this I think was March 7th. And then um, March 26th, I remember, you know, it got completely covered with snow and I was like, you know, this, this probably, probably isn't gonna work. But then it, this was in May, and they were awesome. They turned out great. And the best thing about this was I did not have to, you know, harden the plants off. They were like perfectly adapted to be living outside. Um, and they, they just were great. They were ready to go for transplanting. You don't have to use milk cartons. You can really use anything um, that has kind of a clear-ish top to it where you can poke some drainage holes in it and um, let it go. So that's actually a great solution to seed starting. And it worked so well for me last year. I have about 20 milk cartons um, and various contraptions outside my house at this point. So, and, I'm, and I, I am focusing on things that I think are sort of, you know, that need that cold stratification, you know, the, the period of, of um, cold for the seeds to germinate. So I've got things like some native plants and then you know things like cabbage, broccoli, things that I know can really take the cold. But it's definitely worth trying any seeds that you've got, if you've got some extra seeds and you have the containers, it's worth trying there. Um, so has anybody tried winter sowing? And I, I brought my, <laughs> my milk curtain here, I guess I'll, you know, this is basically the container that I've got. Anybody tried this and had success? Uh, 
Um, and I'm looking at the chat. Um, Britta says, yes, it worked for me last year. I've seeds outside. Laura says, do you water the ones that you put outside? So I do, um, I do, the soil is wet when I put it in. So I make sure, you know, the soil is, is nice and wet. And then really I did not water it again. I mean, I peaked in like in April and then I sometimes watered it through the top hole if I thought the soil looked um, dry. So you kind of get it wet at the beginning and then leave it for quite a while. I did not sink the containers in the snow. I mean, they did get covered in that little snowstorm, but then they were, you know, then it melted off again. Right now they're just sitting out on my porch and you know, it's like four degrees in Anchorage right now, but, um, and I was like, is it too cold? But um, we'll see, you know, I don't know if, I, I don't think they have to be covered by snow. I think, you know, it's for whatever reason, I almost think if, if you've, you know, there's like the idea in science of accumulated thermal units, you know, they're, they're getting enough heat each day to germinate. So it's worth a shot and I, um, I don't know if different, you know, um, outdoor temperatures will make a difference, but I'm hoping that it works because I've got about 20 containers out there and it's super easy. I mean, it's like, if you have the containers, you might as well try it. Yeah. Um, and by the, and I love, by the way, the, the absolute queen of YouTube and Facebook winter sewing, her name is Cheryl Mann. She actually used to live in my neighborhood and I, you know, I wanted to interview her about winter sewing. And she said, oh, I never gardened when I was in Alaska. She lives in California now, but um, she did used to live here. Um, and Gary's saying it only works for certain seeds, maybe in Alaska. Have, have you tried it, Gary? I haven't tried it yet, but I have some clam shells that I've uh, been gathering. Jeff Lowenfels mentioned it in his column a few weeks ago, and I have some clam shells. I have the seeds ready to go, but I haven't put them out yet. I've been gathering clam shells that have that are about at least six inches high, because he he cautioned in that article if they're not high enough, start growing the things will just start wrapping around up inside. So I've got five or six, and uh, I was going to put them out, but we had that big windstorm a few, couple weeks ago. Remember that? And that's one thing he said was put them where they're not going to blow away. So I plan to get them out this week sometime. Great. Oh, great question. Do I use potting soil for winter sowing? I did. I did actually use um, potting soil with some, and I mixed some fertilizer in it. So this would not be where you'd want, say, for example, pro mix or sort of like a sterile like seed starting medium. I think you do want potting soil so that it has a little bit of nutrition in it for when the seed germinates. So I mean, that, that mixture sounds good. I would make sure it has a little bit of, of fertilizer in it. So for when the, cause it, it's not just germinating but they are growing there for, you know probably a month. Okay, I will go back to our program here. And um, so then we'll get to containers. So if you want to plant indoors and you are, you know, trying to do it on the cheap, just about anything can become a planting pot. And probably the biggest thing is just drainage. That's what children are great at, like hammering holes and things. So if you're working with a school group or something, um, just plan for adequate drainage and make sure to poke holes in the bottom. Um, and if you're working with a large group, I found it really helpful to have like stations. So you could have, you know, one group cutting, one group putting holes in the bottom, one group filling it with soil. So just, you know, making kind of thinking about your arrangement of people and materials. And what's easy and what's cheap is not often the same thing. So like these here are, if you are out in the bush and you get the federal school lunch, they often have these cereal containers. And it does, you know, it, it takes time to poke holes in the bottom of these things. So unless you have a group that can do this, you know, it's probably good maybe to invest in actual equipment. So the other thing about this size container is if you put, you know, if you put seeds in this size, they can grow until May, until it's time to transplant. If you have smaller containers, you're gonna to have to transplant up. It just means a little bit more work, but obviously, you know, these trays take up quite a bit of space. And this was, this, you know, is actually a greenhouse. So there's a quite a bit of space in here, but these containers are great if you're looking for some cheap containers. And this one, um, this was from a picture from Haynes. Do you wanna tell us about this container, 
Mardell, it um, looks like cardboard with plastic lined. Sure. Um, what we did, because we had people coming with all different levels of experience and, and habits of it, um, I'm a soil blocker. And so I brought my soil block, my blocker makers to, to the Victory Garden. And Here for those go. of you who don't oh. know what they are, they are um, uh, metal apparatuses that you basically put into a wet soil mix and it compacts it into a block that needs no plastic around it or anything like that. And so you have these individual blocks sitting right next to each other. And that's what those pictures that you saw um, are, is those um, I have, they, they come out in blocks of six and in blocks of um, six and four and all of that. And so we just put them in cardboard boxes. What I find is, is that they do really well when watered from the bottom. So that's why they're lined with plastic. And we just use sturdy, I like waxed um, cardboard boxes because those are the sturdiest. Put plastic, good, good plastic, um, couple layers because you don't want your water leaking out all over the place. And that's what we grew them in for um, a long time. And you can see some of those are a little leggy because those were the ones that were against the window and they're reaching for the light you see there on the right side. So how did you water that setup? Um, my favorite way of watering blocks is, is that I leave a little space on the outside and I, I do a deep watering about once a week and I actually water from the bottom. But that's not the only thing I do. I also use a sprinkler can and water from the top as well. But I find that if I don't do that, like really kind of saturating them about once a week, they tend to dry out. So that's just the pattern that I've found that works well for me. Okay. And, and what, uh, did you worry about did needing drainage or anything? I'd worry that I would overwater it. <laughs> no, no, they, um, I, I have not had problems with that. I've, I've, the problem that, that I have had with blocks and the reason that I do this, um, um, watering from the bottom is, is that they do tend to dry out a little bit faster if you don't watch them. But, um, um, and then it decide, It depends upon the size of the blocks too. The smaller blocks are gonna dry out faster. Um, but I don't find that I have to watch them any more vigilantly than I do pots. You know, you have to watch for watering because that's what'll kill little seedlings. Yes. Okay. And then um, you can also make containers. I put in the little PDF I dropped in the chat, which I can do again, that you can make, you know, little origami, newspaper containers I have one sitting next to a four inch pot so you can see how big it is that that works out great and you know that would be really fun with a school group or scout group or something to make pots out of paper but you know that takes time so if you don't have time you might want to buy your materials and then of course you can use you know all kinds of things if once you start looking around at your trash um, thinking huh could this be used as a pot your brain like will will switch I will say though you know um if you, you know, once you're transplanting these things into our Alaskan soil, it's really too cold for this thickness of paper to break down. So this is something I would probably carefully rip off the, the newspaper or paper towel. You could add that to your compost pile, but I wouldn't plant this directly in the ground just because it just doesn't decompose fast enough. Okay, and now let me stop there. Was there, were there any other comments, Keenan, on you know, pots and things like that to use. I do have a question. Um, do you find that you can plant the newspaper ones directly in the ground here in Alaska? Any experience with that? I, I, I guess I would say I haven't done it because I don't think I, I wouldn't do it. I would, I would carefully rip off the newspaper. And Mardell, there's a question for you here. Uh, what's the depth of the soil block? How big are they? In there's um, several different sizes. The one that I use most, there's a, um, a two inch blocker. And then the one that I use the most that my plants stay in, um, I believe that those are three inch. They're smaller than a four inch pot. I use less soil than a four inch pot, but I find that my most of my plants can stay in those until I'm ready to put them out in the garden. And just quickly, like what pushed you over the edge to do the soil blocker? I've been thinking about it and I'm like, eh, what, what, why do you really like it? 
I got tired of using plastic and yeah. I found that even I reuse my plastic over and over and over again, but I still found myself running out of plastic and being tempted to go buy more. And I, I just don't want to do that. There's so many, you don't have the plastic when you need the plastic pots when you need it. So that was what pushed me over the edge. And I find that it gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm definitely here in Haines. There are um, very experienced gardeners who don't really like blocks. And then there are those of us who are, are block fans. And so I think each person um, based on their own experiences and their own habits will, will choose. The bad thing about it is, is that they're expensive. These blockers are not cheap. And so um, I success or I um, suggest to people is go in with your neighbors. You can easily have three or four people using the same block because you can make them ahead and and all of that. So share them. There's there's no reason that you have to have your own very own blocker. Keenan, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I would I can speak to some blocks a little bit. I, I do think um, along with Mardell that that they are really nice because they eliminate all that plastic um, that you know you store for you know nine months out of the year and yet yeah, like Mardell said then when you need them maybe you don't have enough and then you just kind of keep on ac accumulating all these plastic trays that really don't have much other purpose um, but I, I would caution though for, for soil blocking you really have to make sure that you get the right like mixture of of soil and that you're getting the right um, uh, yeah, like growing medium for soil blocks. Like I think last year I tried it. Um, it was my first time using soil blocks last year and I tried to do it really just like on the cheap and I just used like pro mix and then some um, worm castings from our like worm bins that we have. Uh, and I don't think that that was, that was the right thing to do. And, and most, if you look it up there, there are tons of recipes out there like for soil block recipes, but you want to add um, different things to make sure that it's still kind of aerated because at first I was confused I'm like wait but if you're compacting the soil so much like how are the roots really going to be able to breathe but that's all really depends on if you're using the right mixture of of growing mediums and then it, if you do use the proper mixture then there is like adequate um, room for like the roots to get oxygen and to breathe and, and to really like expand um, but I think yeah the soil blocks that I made last year ended up it's really drying out very fast and we're so compact that it kind of stunted the plant growth. So mm -hmm. I do think soil blocks are great, but really just make sure that you invest in getting the right um, soil mixture for them. Sinead, have you had some experience with them? What, what was your mixture? Um, yeah, when I used the seed blocks, it was at my past job when I worked at the UAF Office of Sustainability, we started all our seeds that way. And the potting mixture that we used was just like a store bought bag of seed starting um, soil. So I don't remember exactly what it was. But yeah, um, we used lunch trays under them, because um, UAF had, you know, a ton from when they used to have a cafeteria. So yeah, it was a really awesome way to start a ton of seeds without any plastic. And that actually leads um, great into our next little discussion, which is about the soil that you use for, to start seeds. And I would say this is where I spend my money. You know, if I'm re recycling everything, this is where I'll buy a big bag of ProMix. And um, it is, you know, it's really lightweight. It's just, you know, it's perfect for starting seeds. I do, you know, take some, you can see I put it in that little Rubbermaid tub and I moisten it first. You know, it's sort of the perfect wet amount when you squeeze it and it holds its shape, but it's not so wet that it's drippy. And of course, ProMix, you, you will need fertilizer later. So, and I, um, this is a, a great place to hear from different people about your, your different seed starting mix. Um, so like Sinead said, you know, finding a, a mix labeled seed starting is a good bet. And again, this is where I spend my money just because like I've tried things before, like using old potting soil that just didn't work for starting seeds. I do have like, I, I use, you know, um, since I plant a lot of dahlias, I'll keep those pots 
And when I'm ready for to, to pot up my, my starts, I'll use old potting mix. But for the seed starting, I use, you know, fresh seed starting mix. But I know there's some different opinions on that one. So let's, I know Keenan, you talked about worm castings. What was your seed starting mix? Sure. Um, so actually I went to just buy some, usually I'll use that pro mix, like that same um, package that Emily showed in that last photo, but I went to Home Depot and they didn't have any this year. Um, so instead I, I just brought, um, I bought peat, just like peat, or like, or sorry, sphangum moss, I guess is what it, what it is. Um, just a big bag of sphangum moss. And I also have um, some like perlite and vermiculite just in big bags. Um, so then I kind of just mix my own. And that's like mostly what the pro mix is anyways, is really just that kind of growing medium. And so it's, you can mix your own if you have um, like mostly the space to like store giant bags of sphangum moss or giant bags of perlite or vermiculite then you can kind of make your own. Um, I also always save compost left like over, like before it freezes in the fall, I'll collect like a big tote of compost from our gardens. And then I'll add that to our seed starting mixes. Um, yeah, just to kind of get some different microorganisms in there um, and, and have something for when the, when the seed germinates and, and is able to grow off. Um, and then I'll mix a little bit of our worm castings into my to my soil mix to um, just to add some extra fertilizer for like once the seeds get going. How about you, Mardell? Well, in my personal garden, I break the rules and I use all uh, old potting soil. I have a lot, a lot of compost in mine, however, and I think that that is what probably saves me. Um, I. I create a lot of compost so I can use a lot of compost. So my potting mix is a very unscientific. Um, I usually just add a little bit more each year. But the thing about um, using old soil and why it doesn't, that's why I, I, I'm defining my personal use versus a victory garden. We have thrown out every not thrown out, we're putting it out in our outside garden, every bit of any kind of soil that we used or was exposed to our greenhouse last year because we had a really bad case of aphids. Um, there was some just not paying attention. And if any of you have aphid experience, you know not paying attention for one week um, you, you have lost the battle. And that's what happened in the greenhouse. So therefore, they, that's, much of that soil has been exposed and we did not want to take the least little bit of chance that we have infested soil. And that's the downside of using old soil is, is that you are exposing it to um, insect eggs and whatnot, but also diseases. So um, in our victory garden, we're starting out all with new. We use potting soil. I'm a believer of adding a little bit of nutrients to that potting soil. Um, the other way you can do it is just to add your nutrients with water, with foliar. Um, and we did that as well. So that's kind of how we did it at the victory garden, because that's all we had. We just bought big, huge um, bags of potting soil. And Laura, I'm not sure I understand your question. I never thought about potting soil aging out of utility. Did, um, did I, what did you mean? Oh, um, I don't use old potting soil for seed starting. I definitely use it. So I, I'll use um, the old potting soil for when I pot up the, the seed start. So like when, you know, when I go from like, you know, the small, smaller to bigger and bigger, that's when I use my old potting soil. Yeah, and I, I absolutely use it, you know, a little bit like Mardell, I guess I would say I, I tend in the greenhouse, I try to use my new stuff if I'm buying new soil. Um, and then I'll, you know, like, you know, old um, pots from the greenhouse I put out in the garden where they can be exposed to the whole ecosystem. I don't use it for seed starting because it can sometimes have a lot of weed seeds in it. You know, if these were plants that were outside and, um, you know, just various little weeds in there, um, it might, it just, you know, my, I have, I've done it before and my starts have not been as, as successful. 
So I'm not sure exactly why that is. It's a good question. And but... Elise, am I understanding there's a miscommunication? Is, is this person understanding that when you use, when you say old potting soil, you don't mean old potting soil by age. You're meaning potting soil that's been used prior to this. Old potting soil, a bag of potting soil that is two years old is not going to be any different, at least in my opinion, it's not going to be any different now than it was when it was first put in the bag two years ago. Yeah, that might be the misunderstanding, like old versus used. Okay, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, anybody else have some experience they want to share with this about your seed starting mix and soil that you use? Um, I can add to that. I know a lot of people will say to like sterilize your your potting soils and like if you want to like reuse it year to year then sterilize it to kill like weed seeds or insect seeds. Um, I don't know to me like that sounds like a ton of work <laughs> first off that I don't really want to do um, and then secondly yeah it doesn't seem like the best for just for like the life and like health of the soil in my opinion. Um, but yeah, mostly like the work part for me just sounds like a ton of work to keep shuttling like trays of soil in and out of your oven. So <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. All right, let's see. Okay, and then back to my little slideshow here. And this was just, you know, again, if you're if you're working with a group of people, it's great to have your buckets of soil spread out in different places again, so you could sort of have stations. And just my experience working with children, they always want to press down really hard to pack in the soil and they need to be taught not to do that because the plant roots do need air. You don't, you, you just kind of tap it gently on the ground rather than pushing it as hard as you possibly can. Okay, and then planting seeds, you know, uh, obviously the seed package will tell you how deep to plant, but a rule of thumb to use is to whatever the seeds um, width is, you know, plant it about twice as that deep. And for bean seeds, you know, that's really easy. It's about, you know, an inch, an inch tall or so. For tiny seeds, it depends. And, and that really comes with experience or just reading the seed packages, but you can help, you know, you can help new gardeners just with that general rule of thumb. Okay. So while they're in your window, your seeds do need to stay moist. You can use wet newspaper if you pay attention. Plastic containers with lids are great to use. And then once the seeds have germinated, the plastic should be removed. Most seeds do like it warm. Some, some seeds need darkness for germinating. Some need heat. You know, again, it just, that's a simple Google if you, if you really need to know which seeds need what. And watering, so for your brand new seeds, you do need to be careful watering. So Mardell mentioned watering from the bottom and that to me, that's a really great way. So, you know, putting the water in your tray and basically having it wicked up, that will help your plants. I, I do have the, in particular, like I'm, I start artichokes every year and they are very, very fickle and, and fragile. Their leaves will get diseased. If you water them from the top, their leaves can't bear to be wet. Once they, once they reach like maturity, they're much tougher plants, but as seedlings, I think that's why nurseries don't sell artichokes artichoke starts because they're just a pain in the butt. Um, you really need to, they're very fragile, you need to pay attention to them. And using diluted fertilizer solution every few days is, is a great way to get your seeds going as well. And I just put here, pay attention. <laughs> a lot of people can walk past little seedlings that are dying and they do need to just, you know, check in on them every so often so that you're making sure they have everything they need. Okay, and I see a few questions, so I'll... Let me see my next, oh yeah, okay. I'll stop there and let's see. Um, any comments from that section about watering? Oh, Laura asked about root stimulator. Yeah, you know, um, the package of root stimulator will tell you what it's good for. And like, you know, usually like they say it's not for brassicas, if I remember, you know, certain packaging I was looking at once. And that I would do that when you um, transplant or, you know, when you plant, transplant it out or when, you know, not as a seedling, I would do that later. And 
Um, Gary, oh, it's hard to find potting soil that doesn't have fertilizer added. Well, that's your pro mix. I think sunshine mix is another one that is good for seed starting. And Sinead, yes, watering starts from the bottom. Have you done that before? Yeah, um, especially with seed blocks. I think that's really the best way to water them. Um, but yeah, even with ones you do in plastic, I, I think watering from the bottom is plants always like that more, I feel like. Mardell? One other thing I'll say about watering is, is that I have a, um, a specific watering can that I use every spring because it's got a very small spout. And if you use your typical watering can, it will just, it'll move your seeds, it'll drown them, you, you just make a mess. Whereas if you have a, a watering can that you can be a little bit more delicate and put it, especially on blocks, but on anything, um, it just helps. And I use this watering can only in the spring because it is a patience. I'm very impatient to use this really slow watering can later in the seasoning, in the season, but it really is vital to me um, this time of year when I'm starting plants. And that's a great tip, Gary, misting the seedlings. That's a really good one too. Okay, I'm almost done here. So the next section is on hardening off your plants. And this is something, if you're working with a group of people, you have to give them very specific instructions about this because new gardeners don't definitely don't know, you know, you think you, you have these plants and you want to sit them out in the sun, like won't they love the sunshine? But plants do need to be transitioned from the protected indoor environment to the outside very slowly. And I start by putting them out in the shade or maybe in dappled sun for a few hours at a time and then increasing by the day. You want to avoid strong winds, although like Mardell said earlier, you know, a little bit of wind is, is really good for them, helps, you know, strengthen their stems. But um, you have to do it carefully. And of course, it varies by plant. There's some plants I've had that like, you know, I wasn't paying attention and they'll lose all their leaves and then they'll be fine. They'll grow back. Some plants you can kill, um, you'll sunburn them. But usually, you know, plants want to live and they'll survive this, you know, just be a little bit gentle on them. Um, any tips on hardening off from our experts? Um, yeah, I would just reiterate that point about um, I ch choosing uh, for the first few days, like I wouldn't put them out when it's like super sunny out, you know, I find those days when it's kind of a bit cloudy, um, maybe intermittent sun, but like for those first few days, really, it's best to like time it when there you have some cloud, cloud coverage, and like that's a great time to like get them going for a bit before they really get exposed to full sun. And I think it's always worth it to be more on the cautious end of it, especially like when it comes to sun exposure from the beginning, um, kind of having more of that patient approach, I think pays off for the plants in the long run. Yes, and this is, you know, this is why that winter sowing idea is so great. Like I didn't have to harden them off at all. <laughs> and let's see, could I put young cold weather plants into the unheated greenhouse? Ooh, when the soil softens, but it still freezes at night. I personally would not risk it. Although, so um, I had an, an unheated greenhouse that I put plants in all the time and I would, so I would cover them. Um, Can I jump in here? Yeah, one, go ahead. One of the things that I was going to say that um, has worked well for me the last few years is that I take my trays of seedlings and put in my unheated hoop house. And I just put it on top of my beds that are eventually going to be planted, but I'm using it as a storage place. And I still will harden them off. I will still take them in and out. But instead of doing that for a week, I do it for three or four days. I find that the, my biggest problem is any wind is the hardest on my seedlings, as well as it seems like the plastic um, cuts down the intensity of the light a little bit. Um, I've had absolutely no burn or anything with my plants since I've been doing that. So certainly not planting them in the soil in an ungreeted, in a honey, in an unheated greenhouse, but just using it as a storage space has worked really well for me. Yeah, thanks, Mardell. That reminds me, I do, when I bring out my tomatoes, I put them in the greenhouse and 
you're right. There, there's no problem with um, sunburn with the with just the you know the greenhouse sheeting on it. But um, Laura's question about putting them in the unheated greenhouse at night, I you know I guess I don't know if I would risk it. I mean, you could cover them. But, you know, if you get a hard frost, like 25 degrees, then, you know, you're, then you have to go to the nursery and buy things. So I would be very careful about that. Anybody else have experience with that? All right, Laura, you're on your own. Good luck. <laughs> Um, okay, and I really think that's just about the end of my slides there. Yep. So then it's summer. Um, here's the Haynes Victory Garden. What a great picture there. And um, I'll, I put this also in the little PDF. If you want to plant a sunflower, it's a great time to do that right now in a milk carton if you've got one. Um, and that means we have, I'll, I'll put that list of PDFs or the PDF with all the links in it in the chat again. And we'll just open it up to any other questions that people have. Yeah, Gary Matthews, question. Uh, when I was referring to uh, potting soil without fertilizer, I, I, I plant everything in potting soil outside because I have all raised beds, some are three feet high, some are <clears throat> in containers, and so forth, and but try to find and I, I just refilled a whole bunch of things last year, and I could not find any pot on the soil that was not fertilized. In fact, I I bought some that I thought was not, and I started looking in the fine print, clear in the bottom of the bag, it was. And so, uh, other than buying soil premixed soil in Anchorage, which you can buy from suppliers here, does anyone know any source for potting soil that does not already have chemical fertilizers in it? <clears throat> Well, Gary, I think you're talking about making your own. So, you know, buying bags of vermiculite, um, you know, bags of peat or whatever, and making your own mixes, which a lot of people do. And there, um, there's plenty of really good recipes from the Cooperative Extension Service. It may, I don't know, maybe Gina, you have that info at, um, at your fingertips on different soil, you know, preparation ones. And I guess, um, so my, my own background, I come from, a, you know, the, like the permaculture background where um, I'm using a lot of compost, you know, leaves and brewery waste and coffee grounds and stuff. So I'm, I'm making my soil that way. And I'm really only using my purchase soil for seed starting. And then everything else is kind of, you know, soil that I've created or nature has created really through, you know, natural decomposition. And I'm using that for and putting in pots for dahlias and stuff. Although I will say for tomatoes, I do often buy potting soil. Um, has anyone made their own soil mixes from scratch? Um, I do mostly that. Um, we did not for the Victory Garden because it just seemed too tedious. We, we did a uh, seed um, or a start sale. And so we went through a lot of potting soil. Um, but my own, I have used various um, recipes through the years. And then, like I said, I break the rules. I usually add in my old potting soil and just refurbish it. So mine's not very scientific at all. Um, and it seems to work well for me. And I'll get Gary again. <clears throat> and I use, I reuse my old potting soil. <clears throat> but if I need to add, sometimes I'll need to add some to it. And that's when I <clears throat> prefer not to put in the new stuff. Sometimes I've even you because it says it says on the bags will fertilize for up to six months. Sometimes I just get it and dump it out and just let it sit out there all year long in a big barrel or something like that, and then use it the next year. And I don't know if that's <clears throat> if, if the chemical fertilizers are dissipating during that amount of time or not. I have no idea. I just prefer not to do that. Is all. Keenan, did you have experience with seed mixes? Uh, I made my own this year only because there was no pro mix at the store. So oh, right. um, yeah, so I just, I bought um, 
some sphangum moss, and then I have vermiculite and perlite, and I kind of just like mixed it together based on what it looks like, like using other promix and kind of, again, like not very scientific, um, just, yeah, based on like what I've seen in other mixes and like what I think is just enough vermiculite and perlite to like properly aerate the soil. Yeah, Gary, do you use compost? Yes. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I think as long as you're, you're I add some each year. I add an inch or two of compost in all my beds each year. Yeah, I think that's you know, that's a good way to go. And that, you know, it, it, there's no problem with reusing um, soil. You're just, you know, adding adding to it each year, making sure it's, you know, got the best little ecosystem going in there that you can so that your plants are getting fed. I've I've also been occasionally adding alfalfa meal. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, I've, started, oh. I've started doing that as well. And I have a question about if any of you have had experience or have heard, I've been hearing complaints about the coconut core, not, um, mostly the complaints have been about for seed starting. And I haven't really experienced it, but I don't feel like I've used it too much. I'm just in the beginning phases of it. Does anybody have any experience that of either positive or negative of the coconut core use? I don't personally. I I I I used it one year. I want to say like eh, maybe four or five years ago. I made like a. Um, uh, you know, like a starting mix with some of it in there for tomatoes. And I used um, fishy peat, like fishy peat and coconut core. Um, and it was fine. I don't, I just didn't do it again because um, it, you know, it, I can't, it's, it was hard to source. I think there was somebody out in the Valley that had gotten a bulk, you know, shipment of it. And I, you know, I was kind of debating like, is it really, you know, uh, earth friendly to get this, coconut core shipped from I don't know it's hard in Alaska we ship everything in right which which is one of the reasons why um, I started using it because it was more accessible to us it's much easier getting this tiny little condensed block sent on the barge because um, we can't just we do have one store that we can go to and get this stuff but when they run out then you've got to go elsewhere and so I have found that the coconut core is accessible because it's easier to ship um, but um, yes, it is a question. Some people think it's more sustainable and some people think it's not as sustainable. It definitely is being shipped from tropical paradises. So anyway, um, I'm curious what other people have to say. Um, and Laura asked a question, um, seeds that age out the fastest, you mean like um, how long you can keep them? That, that's really, I mean, that really depends on storage. I. I tend to, um, I recently tried to like give away lots and lots of seeds. So I'm not keeping them more than a few years. But like I mentioned, you know, I have tomato seeds from 2009 that just sprouted. They're doing fine. So, um, you know, give it a try. You can always do a little germination test if you're patient with your seeds, but lots of things will last a long time. I had some marigold seeds that I purchased like three years ago and I haven't gotten them to germinate. And I don't know why that is. So um, it really depends on storage. And then Iva, thanks for that reminder. There's nothing wrong with starting seeds right in the ground. And, and Keenan, you actually had mentioned that too. You do a lot of that. How about, uh, you wanna talk about the seeds you start right in the ground? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I was glad to see Iva mentioned that too. And I, I think before I talk about seeds we put straight in the ground, I wanted to say too, I think with, like with gardening in general, but like especially gardening in Alaska, like when your window is so short, there's like often this craze that many people find themselves in of like being behind, you know, like even now it's like, oh, I'm already behind. And then you don't really like really catch up until like ever, right? Until like next winter. So I think it's important to not like put that kind of pressure on like yourself or like any kind of garden that you work with that like about being behind, like it's totally okay. Like Iva said, just to put seeds straight in the ground. Um, I know like we will do a lot of like succession planting in our garden and we'll put um, like kale right in the ground and lots of other brassicas um, straight into the ground. Um, I've also even, there's another gardener 
in Anchorage who has some seeds inside and like does a lot of seeds outside too. And he always does kind of like a side by side comparison. And like oftentimes he'll find like that the seeds that he planted direct that, that he directly sowed are maybe like only a week or two ahead of the seeds that he transplanted. So even like when you kind of think about all the work, that, you know, that goes into seed starting for some people, people are like, I'm not going to mess with it. Like, I don't, it's too much work. And um, the plants do just fine being directly sown. Um, so I think that's, that's totally fine. Like I just said, if it's not your jam, then, you know, wait till the soil thaws and, you know, get seeds right out there. And, and a lot of those seeds can be early. like kale, I think needs like a, um, I don't know, like 35 to 40 degree soil to germinate. Like it really doesn't have to be that warm. Um, for a lot of those seeds to germinate. And again, like, as like, I think Jeff Lowenthal says this a lot in his article, but it's not as much about air temperature for seed germination, soil temperature. So as soon as like the, as it thaws, as the ground thaws, like you can get a lot of those cold hardy plants going outside. Thanks, that's a great way to, to end our program. <laughs> like, if this is all too much work, forget about it just put seeds right in the ground and give it a shot and hopefully it'll work for you. So um, thanks everybody for coming and thanks especially Mardell and Keenan for joining us today. That was really awesome to have you. And I'll stick around if anybody has questions or comments. Our next program, oh, let me see what that is actually. Iva, do you have that at your fingertips? What's our next one going to be? Ooh, I do not have that at my fingertips. Um, do you, Gina? <laughs> I'm giving you a hot second. I, I, I think find, I can get it. find it. Let's see. I do have it at my fingertips. Woo! Let me shrink my screen down, though, because I can't see it right now. Our next program is on March 29th, and it is incorporating a community garden into your food pantry. Awesome. Um, all right. And Margaret, I see your hands up. Um, my question is this. Um, I have a lot of moss that's just growing on the ground that I'd like to clear off because it's, uh, is that moss something that I can put as a filler in my beds that I'm developing or is that not a good thing to put into my growing beds? So it um, is the moss in your raised bed? I guess I would say I, I wouldn't worry too much about the moss. Um, you know, you can, ver you know, once you might like peel off, peel it off a little bit and then add it, you know, to your compost pile or put it somewhere else in your garden. But I wouldn't worry you know, it's saying that your soil is a little bit acidic. I wouldn't worry too much about the moss. Well, it's just that it's growing somewhere else. And I'm always trying to figure out things that I can fill the new area for growing. And I wasn't sure if the moss would be something that I can just toss in, just like you can toss in the straw that you've put on your plants and so forth with the seaweed. Is that something that I should put as a compost thing to let sit and decompose somewhere else? Or is it a safe thing that I can add without it growing and becoming, taking over anything? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I think it's okay. Okay, thank you. I have a question. This is Evelyn. Hi. Uh, so those milk cartons that you do there in Anchorage, does it, Temperature have to be above freezing or can, cause it gets, it's still really cold here at night. I know, yeah. Uh, no, you can, um, you know, I, I fully expect that the, the seeds I put in my milk carton are frozen solid right now, <laughs> um, but they're okay. And when the time is right, they'll germinate. So yeah, you, you can you can do it now. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, I will stop the recording here. So thanks everyone.